Welcome to this episode of The Wolf and the Shepherd. Today we have with us Ed Vincent. Ed, great you could join us today. Thanks. Good to be here, Max. And of course, I keep saying us. It's it's actually just joining me because the wolf had to step out, uh, had some kid issues, uh, big mess. And I know, Ed, before we hit the record button, I kind of went through that. But uh, the wolf sends his apologies. He really wanted to be here and talk about this. But, you know, kids come first. I mean, families first. And that's the way we treat that on, especially on our podcast and especially with work, you know, family comes first. So he had to go take care of some family stuff. So uh, glad Good. you can just kind of hang out with me. And let's talk about Festival Pass. It's very interesting. I read a little bit into it, but I didn't want to learn too much about it because I wanted you to educate me on exactly what Festival Pass is. Sure. So uh, I'll tell you what it is first. And then if you want a little context to the why, <clears throat> every business has a context. But uh So what Festival Pass is, it's a subscription marketplace for live events. So what that means is our members, they come to Festival Pass and they join as a member. And uh, those that choose to, they pay a monthly fee. And that monthly fee is anywhere from $19 to $99 a month. And for that, they get credits and then they can use those credits to go to over 80,000 live events. And the reason they do it is because Um, by committing to a monthly membership or an annual membership. Um, They never pay a ticketing fee for a live event, which is big and huge. Anybody that's ever bought a ticket to any concert or sporting event knows how how, uh, tough those ticketing fees are. And then on top of it, they're always going to pay less through Festival Pass than they will anywhere else. And then, of course, just like... uh, and I'll give an example uh, of like Amazon Prime, but uh, but in general, there, there's other perks to it. They uh, they get access to buy uh, hotel room nights for 20, 30% less than they can anywhere else. They get to inter- interact with artists and other people on the platform. And ultimately on the digital asset side, they'll be able to buy uh, their favorite artist NFTs through the platform. Nice. Uh, lots of stuff we're going to dig into right there. And I, I love the NFT thing. I mean, that's very popular and we're going to get into that a little bit later on in the show. So let's start first with the fees that, you know, as a normal, you know, non-festival pass member, you go out and you say, okay, I want to go to this show. I want to go see, you know, uh, green day. Right. And they say, okay, the ticket is 80 bucks, but by the time you're done, it's like 120 bucks because there's a service fee and a convenience fee and a fee just to look at the website and all that. How is festival pass taking care of getting rid of maybe some of those fees? Yeah, so so the way you explained it, it reminds you of the old cable bill, right? <laughs> it's like uh, here's here's your uh, HBO, and then here's your tax, and here's your other fee, and here's your other fee. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's uh, th- the issue is is it's while of course uh, people want to pay the least amount of money possible to go to the things they want to go to, it's really also about transparency, and it's it gets very frustrating from a consumer perspective to think you're paying one fee, and then by the time you get to the checkout where you're about to hit the button at the last second, there's another 40% tacked onto it at the end. Um, so yeah, so, so that'll, not only is that a problem just in the regular primary ticketing, but it becomes even more of a problem in the secondary marketplace. So anybody that's ever been to, you know, any of the ones out there, whether it's StubHub or others, um, they end up, you know, buying a ticket in the secondary market. And before they check out, there's, you know, a, a lot of fees tacked onto the end. So what we've done is, um, you know, we've aggregated partnerships to ensure we can acquire tickets to events, um, you know, whether it's at wholesale prices or at lower prices than you know, traditional, traditionally it would be at retail. And we effectively pass on that savings to our members. So um, we don't need to charge, egreg- like egregious is the wrong word. We don't need to charge high fees uh, like some of the others would because our business model is really about um, 
you know, giving back to the members. So those who are willing to sign up and, and be part of our membership and get all those benefits, um, we make sure that they they don't pay those ticketing fees. So we give we give money back to our members in return for their commitment for a monthly subscription. Because from a business perspective, and everybody that kind of has ever run a, a business realizes that um, when you have um, known and predictable uh, revenue, meaning monthly subscription, you're able to have less of a margin and still build a good business. Right. No that, no, that makes total sense. So basically what you're looking at is saying, we're going to go out there and for lack of a better term, right. And don't take offense to this. We're going to go out there and we're going to scalp these tickets. Right. And then we're going to turn around and allow our customers to go out there and take advantage of that, but we're not going to make this huge profit. We're not going to buy a $80 ticket and sell it to you for 150 bucks. We're actually going to do the work for you. And in exchange for this subscription part, right. And being able to pay us money to keep us in business, we're going to pass all those savings on to you. So and I, the, I, I know that's a simplistic way to look at it, but yeah. So all of it, except for the first part, right? So, so we're not going out and scalping those tickets. So the one thing a lot of people don't realize, and you know, we, we don't really have to get too deep into this, but uh, in the secondary market, I think sometimes uh, owners of tickets in the secondary market get a bad name. Um, like they, people think of brokers as scalpers and all that kind of stuff. The truth is, is over the last five, five plus years, there's been an evolution where the primary market and the secondary market often work well together. Um, and here's an example uh, I try and use just so people can get it, right? Is, is not all um, secondary market is you know, a quote unquote broker or scalper buying a ticket and then selling it for five times face value and, and making the consumer pay. Um, you know, for example, there's some some brokers, if you want to call them brokers, and the, the same, th there's always a need for a broker uh, to de-risk different primary inventory. Same thing works in the stock market when, you know, somebody takes a, an IPO and they, they, they uh, release the IPO. The only reason they release it into the stock market is because a bunch of quote unquote brokers have already committed to 70, 80% of that offering, um, making sure that it actually succeeds. So there's a balance between secondary and primary. I don't want to get too confusing on all these analogies, but, but like, for example, I know friends that uh, are in the brokerage business, which we're not, um, but they own, let's say a couple hundred tickets to a Dallas Cowboys game. You're in, you're in Fort Worth. So now all of a sudden I own a couple hundred tickets to every Dallas Cowboys boys game because I put out millions of dollars years ago to own to buy seat licenses and I happen to own these tickets. Of course there's going to be one or two games a year that is in super high demand that it doesn't matter where you want to try and get the ticket from it's going to cost twice as much than face value. But that same owner also owns eight other tickets for the season that might sell for less than face value. So the reality is is you know whether it's on festival pass or any other sites sometimes people can get tickets below face value because most marketplaces are really um, supply and demand and they're dynamically priced based upon demand. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And, you know, it, in looking at you, I'm going to guess you're a little bit younger than me and I'm not going to ask your age or anything like that. You're more than welcome to volunteer that information. But I remember staying up all night and me and a few buddies of mine going to a Ticketmaster counter at Sears and standing yep. in line and buying Smashing Pumpkins tickets in yep. the early 90s. Those days, of course, are over. Everything's internet. You know, you, you go on there and yes, there's still a tickets on sale at a certain time, right? But then you just sit there at home and you hit that refresh button, right? It wasn't how early do I have to get in that ticket master line and do all that? Then I remember shortly after that Pearl jam going to Congress and kind of testifying before them, trying to get rid of all of these fees and all that. They fought the good fight, but it didn't happen. Is your company kind of going along those same lines to, to maybe equalize this out to where people don't have to go through those hassles of nowadays hitting that refresh button or maybe back in my day of standing in line and trying to get a ticket? 
Well, first of all, um, I'm old enough to remember those lines. Um, I, I am 48, if that helps. Oh, okay. Okay, good. So so now that embarrasses me more because I thought you were younger than me. You're older than me. So <laughs> that, that should make you feel better because I look a lot older than you, but you're older than me. So Not true. Your beard is just longer. If, if I let it grow, you can see all the gray coming through. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got a lot of gray in there. But I got a lot of gray in my hair. Of course, you got a cap on too. Yeah, and, it's true. Uh, it's and, true. And, and hey, by the way, give a shout out to your buddy's bar there in California. Oh, my cat, it's my brother's bar. So McAllen's Public House in Brea, California. So it's a great bar. If you're, if you're ever at Disneyland or go to comedy shows in Brea, just swing by and get, get a McAllen whiskey. There you go. But so anyway, stuff. yeah. Yeah. So, so, so to give you perspective, right? So it's what we're, we're not trying to um, really disrupt anything that exists. We want to be a, a partner in the community, right? So um, we understand that there's many ways to get access to tickets and buy tickets and different people have different approaches to it. Some people might go to a specific source or site and not care if they pay 65% more because they need it right now and they need a, you know, they need a specific seat, et cetera. And that's all good. And we would have that same ticket anyway, so they can still get all that through Festival Pass. But the key for us really is having a new experience and how you attend live events, right? So um, we want it, like most ticketing has been very um, transactional, meaning that nobody really cares where they got the ticket traditionally. It's like, hey, I want to go to Smashing Pumpkins, just want to find out a good seat and at a price I can afford and get the ticket and I don't care where I got it um, as long as it's trusted and verified and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but for us, it's really about building an experience and we really want to build a frictionless social experience. So we have a lot of things we're building into Festival Pass. One is just the, the way you get the tickets, right? So by committing to a membership monthly or yearly, you're never going to pay a ticketing fee. So you immediately are saving money. The second thing is you're getting all the other benefits that come along with it. And you talk about waiting in line or pushing the button. Um, you know, we'll, we've already started building and we'll continue to build a lot of great relationships with the artists directly. And we can talk about that as we roll into the micro subscriptions and the artist NFTs down the, down the line. But, um, but having those relationships directly with the artist management and talent, as well as with the events that are actually creating these events or these concerts or festivals, et cetera, um, we're able to provide value for those who are putting the festival on. And then some of our memberships will be able to get access to certain allotments of tickets that don't exist anywhere else. So as a member, you'll, you know, you might get the first thousand tickets that Smashing Pumpkins, using your example, I don't even know if they're still touring, uh, but Smashing <laughs> Pumpkins is actually uh, is selling, right? So it's all of that ability to be, be more part participatory in the community and and really be a part of it and i can go on and on about some of the cool features we have like on our mobile app that's coming out soon you know it's it's much more like instagram and tiktok where you can discover things that you never even knew you wanted to discover just by flipping through events and following certain things um so it's it, it's really it's a lot more fun and more gamified than you'd ever find on a traditional kind of transactional ticketing environment no that's cool and Honestly, you're kind of alluding to one of the questions that I had for you on this, because, of course, it's called Festival Pass. Yep. So it, initially, you think to yourself, OK, well, this is just going to get me into festivals. It's, you know, to use some old school like Lollapalooza or, you know, uh, and of course, you being also from Texas, like Edge Fest, things things like that, uh, the old school Woodstock. So you immediately think, well, all this is getting me into is festivals. But based off this description, it's not just festivals. It's the ability to get into just normal and yeah, normal, right? Normal concerts, right? That have like two or three bands or whatever. So it's not like you're going around to all these festivals and hopping in a van like in the seventies and trying to follow the grateful dead around or something like that. And so you pay a subscription to do that. This allows you to no kidding, kind of look around and say, Hey, like going to six flags, I'm going to buy a season pass and I can go to six flags one time, or I can go almost every day. And with my subscription, it's up to me to get the most benefit out of this by all of the product offerings. Yeah. So first thing is on the name, right? So the reason we chose Festival Pass as a name is 
not because it's only for festivals. It, it's because of the people that go to festivals. And um, there's a great stat that in 2019, obviously before COVID, 75 million Americans went to a festival uh, in that year. Um, so it's a lot of people. And of course, when you go down kind of younger generations, the millennials and Gen Zs, uh, they live and budget their life around experiences. And they're used to paying subscriptions for most of the things they do. So, so there's a couple of things in terms of um, how people engage in that. But yes, to, to your point is we are not just festivals. That really is just, it invokes an emotion, makes you feel good. It's a really a brand, just like Starbucks. Uh, it doesn't even sound like coffee. But, uh, but eventually people say, oh yeah, festival pass, I get it. Um, every time I go out, I feel like I'm uh, in a festive festival environment. But we have concerts, we have sporting events, we have Broadway theater, we have anything you can think of that is related to a live event we have on the platform. Food and wine events, like your beer and brat festivals, South Beach food and wine, like things like that, right? So we have all of these events that people can go to and they can choose to go to them however they choose, right? So the second thing you said, which is true, is if you sign up for a subscription and you get a certain amount of credits, it's not that you can go to events unlimited because that's a bad business model. And uh, I previously uh, spent some time as the, the interim chief data officer of a company called MoviePass, if you ever heard of that, and they just had a bad business model. Um, so it's not about unlimited use. What it is, is about the best way to get the most value out of the credits you have. So you could have 100 credits a month and choose to go to, you know, five uh, events in um, uh, downtown Fort Worth or in Austin, pick a venue that you like, like Stubbs or somewhere else. And I might pay eight to 12 credits to go see my favorite band, uh, at, you know, on a Wednesday night. But I could also pay 80 credits to go see the Dallas Cowboys, or I could pay, you know, 200 credits to go to ACL in uh, the festival, you know, here in Austin. Um, so the point is, is you can choose to use those however you want. But when you sign up for a membership, um, the higher tier the membership is, first of all, you never pay a ticketing fee. And the higher tier the membership, the cheaper it costs you to go to those events. Gotcha. And, and of course, when you say the cheaper it becomes, the less credits it requires to go to those events yeah, actually, in your what, system. Yeah, actually the way it works is if at $19 a month, you're paying about $1.27 per credit. And at $99 a month, you're paying about $1.10 per credit. So effectively you're acquiring the credits cheaper. Therefore, when something costs 50 credits, you could do the math, right? You're either paying 60 bucks or you're paying $72 or whatever. Right, no, that makes sense. So. So now I have my membership right to Festival Pass, and uh, it be it my twenty dollars a month or a hundred dollars a month or whatever. And now I have all these things that I'm looking at that I can spend these credits on. And maybe it, it, just like me, I, I'm setting my ways. I'm an old man. Uh, I know what I'd like to go to. Do my credits carry over to the next month if I don't oh, yeah. use them? Absolutely. It's a savings account. Right. So maybe though, as a crotchety old man, I don't realize that maybe there's something I actually want to go to, but I've never heard of. Is there a way that the app might, or, and I call it an app because now once again, we're going to, it is an app. Pan, yeah. We're going to pander to the millennials. Like you say, right. Is there a way that the app will maybe make recommendations based off of what I actually like to go to and enjoy? Absolutely. So two two ways it does that, right? So one is self-selected. So just like, uh, and I'll use Instagram as a, I won't use TikTok because that will probably confuse you and everybody else. But uh, yes, but you, yes, you probably, that, yeah, uh, TikTok is the sound a clock makes. Okay. So Instagram, are you familiar with how Instagram works? Yes. Okay, it, so, well, it well, kind of. You put pictures on there. I mean, so we have an Instagram account, but we don't know what to do with it. So, 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 two things, right? So, the way Facebook works, you've heard of Facebook, right? So, the way yes. So, the way Facebook works is you make friends with people, and then uh, as the, those friends create content, right, that shows up in your feed, right? That makes sense. Instagram is similar, but instead of being friends with somebody, you just follow somebody. So if you like somebody, and that's why it's more relevant here, you follow a band you like, and then every time the band has something to say, they make a post and it shows up in your feed. That makes sense, right? So on Festival Pass, 
it's more similar to Instagram so that if you like Chris Stapleton, if you like the Dallas Cowboys, if you like pick your thing, right? So you might come to on Festival Pass and we have 50,000 performers, 80,000 events, 10,000 venues all on the platform. So if you go in and you say, hey, my favorite place to see concerts is the Superdome, whatever it is. My favorite band is you know, Chris Stapleton, Green Day, and Smashing Pumpkins. And you do, you pick 20 of them. And my favorite uh, artists, or my, sorry, my favorite um, events are Edge Fest and this and this and this. So now you have 20 or 30 things you've self-selected. Every time you open the app, whether it's on the web or on mobile, you immediately see all the events that are happening related to the things you said you liked, right? So that immediately curates a personalized experience for you. Secondarily, we have a whole um, engine that we're building and refining every day, which is more like a little more like the Netflix recommendation engine. So out of the 80,000 events out there, based upon the 20 or 30 things you told me already you do like, and based upon the things you actually do, meaning that you actually went to a Chris Stapleton concert as opposed to just said you liked them, and you went to a Dallas Cowboys game instead, instead of just saying you liked them, we'll start recommending within your feed the things that might be interesting. So for example, what happened in real life to me, I'll explain what, what will happen on the platform. So I went to a country music festival here in Austin that had Chris Stapleton, Willie Nelson, and there was a, I forget his name by the way, but there was another uh, opener uh, who was an actor who sings in that show Yellowstone, if you're familiar with the show Yellowstone. Kevin Costner. Yeah, Kevin Costner is the show, but then there's a, one of the the, the farmhands was actually a real singer. Um, he was an oh, actor. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know who you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So he opened for Chris Stapleton, right? I had never heard of him before. I didn't know who he was, but he was awesome, right? So digitally, that same experience that happened to me in real life would happen on Festival Pass. So if I liked Chris Stapleton, I liked Willie Nelson, I liked whatever, um, all of a sudden, if that, that guy, I think his name was... Ray Raymond, I don't remember, but uh, but whoever that guy is, if he was performing at a club in Austin that might not be an eight thousand person amphitheater, but headlining a show for five hundred people, that would appear in my feed, and I'd be like, oh yeah, I like that guy. And then for eight credits, twelve credits, twenty credits, I can go see that show. So it's all about that recommendation engine, as well as another thing is is it's also what my friends do and my friends see. So the more I want to interact and connect with other friends within the platform. Um, I'll be able to kind of see that, you know, five of my friends went to this show, therefore I might like it too. Right. So now let's flip it to the other side and not just the person that actually wants to go to the shows, but let's talk about the artists or, uh, yep. it, you know, we, we don't need to help Jerry Jones sell Cowboys tickets, but let's talk about maybe the smaller artists or yep. whatever. How can your service actually benefit some of these smaller artists? Great question. And, and I, honestly, I just got back from a music conference in Aspen this, this past week where I spent time with probably 20 artists, managers, and talent agents, all the big guys is all the way down to the independents. And, and we had a lot of the same conversations. But what we're doing on Festival Pass, and, and it's all built, we just are going to slowly begin to release it, is we have this concept of micro subscriptions, which are kind of like badges, if you will. So I'll use these same examples of these artists, but pick any artist you want. Um, Flogging Molly. Floggy Molly, perfect. Are you Irish? Um, but uh, no, I, I'm just a big fan of Floggy Molly. Perfect. So, so fl perfect example. So Floggy Molly. So let's say you're a $49 a month member of Festival Pass, and you happen to be a F Floggy Molly fan, and we built a partnership with Floggy Molly. You could buy for five or ten dollars a month, whatever the exact number is. You can add a badge to your base subscription, and this badge will show that you're a fan of Floggy Molly, but it will also come with a bunch of other benefits. So, what it could mean is not only you're already going to be tracking where their events are, um, but it could mean that you get um, first access to Floggy Molly tickets when they come out. It could mean that once a month or twice a month, Floggy Molly does um, you know an online meeting and greet for the 5,000 people that have this $5 a month micro subscription. It could mean that when you actually do go to the show, because you can prove that you have this micro subscription, you get a personal meet and greet with the band, right? So those are all the things we're building with the artists because 
80, 70, 80% of that revenue from that five or $10 add-on subscription will go directly to the artists. So it gives them an opportunity to have a direct relationship with their super fans, if you want to call it that, and build uh, and, and monetize th that value. So that, that's the first step. And we're in the process of doing that with dozens of artists now. And hopefully within three to six months, you'll see hundreds of artists with micro subscriptions on our platform. Yeah, but isn't that one of the struggles, maybe if you're not Green Day, if you're not Foo Fighters, if you're not Lady Gaga, you know, it, well, they, they just, they can run out and they can charge whatever they want. And there's news stories about, you know, I think there's one with Adele right now that it, the tickets were ridiculous and all this, but then the artists get screwed. So I think it, like you call them super fans, right? I mean, I I've been to flogging Molly shows and I didn't want to buy the shirts because I then found out the band didn't get a big piece of that money that yep. the venue got a bit a piece and this person got a piece and this person got a piece. And I'm like, I'd, I'd rather just support you as the artist. I'm here to see you. I don't really care that much about the venue. You know, yeah, I, so I don't, I, I don't care about all this. I care about the artist. Right. Perfect example. But that, that's exactly what we're getting to. Right. So if you're a super fan of Flaggy Molly and you and five or 10,000, let's say 10,000 other people also are. And, you know, out of the hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, members that we will have on Festival Pass, um, you know, you're paying five or 10 bucks a month and you get all this special access to your favorite band. Put, put the math together. 10,000 fans paying 10 bucks a month. That's 100 grand a month. Right. So the band gets a check for 70, 80 grand a month directly into their pocket because they're doing the work to engage directly with their super fan. So, so that that to me is super fascinating. And that's one of the things that came out of this conference as well as what I've been talking to these artists and managers for, for over a year now is they're looking for ways where they can monetize the relationship with the fans so that they can earn income outside of the traditional system. And, and this is exactly a way to do that. Yeah, and I think a lot of bands, especially a band like Flog and Molly, they don't want their fans to feel like they've got to pay all this extra money to access them or whatever. They don't want to feel like they're ripping them off. Uh, you know, I, I met a lot of guys from Flog and Molly years ago, just literally after the show, and they came down off the stage, and we met them, we talked to them and all that, and they're genuine guys. But guess what? That's their job, and they should make money off of what they create. And, you know, the record business and all that is just put a lot of muddy water in yeah. there for artists and everything. And it sounds kind of like you're solving that problem. Do you kind of feel like you're – I'm not saying you're the savior of no. the music business by any means, but it kind of sounds like you're getting close. Well, we're, what we're doing is we're allowing them another source of income to engage with their fans in a way they get paid. And it, it becomes the bridge to something we mentioned before we started recording, which is what comes next when you have 10,000 super fans that are paying five or 10 bucks a month. Who do you think the first person is going to buy an NFT that you create? Right. So uh, beautiful segue. Maybe you should host this show because uh, you, you did a great job there. So let's talk about the NFT part of this. Uh, sure. NFTs are very popular in the news and everything. A lot of people don't understand them. We, we don't have to dig into what an NFT is or anything like that. Uh, we've, we've talked to some folks about that, but explain how NFTs are working through Festival Pass. Yeah, so that bridge that I was talking about, right? So like what we're doing, uh, we're creating kind of a bridge, right? So within a month or so, um, we're going to allow all of our members to pay for their subscriptions with their crypto wallets, right? So whether they can choose whether to pay with cryptocurrencies or fiat currencies, doesn't matter. Um, so, but, but now engaging and connecting your wallet into your profile, it enables you to potentially purchase an NFT from your favorite artist. So now... Um, when you like Flogging Molly and you're one of 10,000 people that like Flogging Molly, um, we're creating an, an environment that would allow Flogging Molly to mint an NFT right on Festival Pass's platform to our audience, right? So one of the hardest things about NFTs in general, right, is 
you know, you can mint one anywhere, but the point is, is having a community of people that understand it and have a, a crypto wallet connected to it to enable that actual purchase to happen. So there's a couple of things. So Floggy Molly decides, you know, whether that NFT is an image they create, whether it's an album cover, whether it is a song clip, whatever the asset is, um, that is limited of some sort and they make available. Maybe, they, maybe they're, they're going to sell a hundred of them, maybe a thousand of them, whatever they choose. Um, we'll allow them and help them build the smart contract right on our Festival Pass platform so that they can mint that NFT right within our environment and sell it to their super fans. Um, once that NFT is purchased, obviously it, it's owned now by whoever bought it and it can trade anywhere, right? So we're not requiring people to trade it directly on Festival Pass. Once it's owned and purchased, they can trade it on OpenSea, Coinbase, wherever else it gets traded. But the beauty of the way NFTs and smart contracts work is every time it gets traded, the smart contract enables the artist to get a small piece. So, um, you know, it can trade a thousand more times, but then there's a tiny little fraction of a penny or whatever the dollar amount is that goes back to the artist every time it trades. So therefore in perpetuity, they're creating a revenue stream based upon their asset, their art, their thing that they gave away for a certain amount of money. Right. So let's take a band a lot less famous than Flog and Molly, right? How would, how would Festival Pass help out that, and I hate to use this term, but like a, a struggling band, right? You know, just a band, they're, they're playing Friday nights at the, a cool little bar on 6th Street in Austin and all this, yeah. but, it, but they're not touring around the world. How can Festival Pass help them out, not only maybe with the tickets, but also with the NFTs? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the same model, regardless of how uh, small or large a band is. <clears throat> um, often what happens is a band, if they are touring like that and they're going from space to space, whether it's 500 people or 5 million people, they have super fans, otherwise they wouldn't be playing, right? <clears throat> so those 500 people that really follow them, uh, if the band makes them aware that, you know, they're on Festival Pass and, you know, our other hundreds of thousands of members are exposed to that band on Festival Pass, now there's an ability for other people to become an audience for them, right? So where the people that come to Festival Pass are already passionate about what they love, whether it's music, uh, sports, art, uh, Broadway, whatever it is. So we obviously have data on our members. So we're able to introduce whether it be new bands or other bands that are relevant. So it's a, it's a discovery mechanism for that early band. It's the infrastructure, right? Because if you're a small band touring from place to place, you're probably not thinking of how do I write a smart contract? How do I figure out how to you know, set up a Stripe subscription account in order to charge my fans five bucks a month. You know, it, it's infrastructure that takes a little time and effort. So if in this one environment, you already have a predisposed audience of eventually millions of members that are passion, passionate about something, you have an infrastructure where they can always get your tickets. You have an infrastructure where you can allow them to build micro subscriptions and connect and, and make ancillary revenue. And you can mint an NFT right on the platform to the audience that is already there. It's a, it's a no brainer for a, a small artist or a big artist. And you know each level of additional revenue or success will just be correlated to the kind of uh, you know exposure that they would get. Yeah. So now let's look at a typical user. Let's get away from the artist for a minute and let's look at a typical user of the website, soon to be the app. I have my subscription. I'm logging in. What am I seeing? What am I trying to decide? How, how am I going through and clicking on, you know, what I should find to, you know, go to shows and, and let's steer away from music a little bit. Let's pretend, yeah, I want to go see the Cowboys. Yeah, I, I like that. Maybe I want to take the wife out to a musical at Bass Hall, whatever. Yep. What, am, what am I seeing on the website? How am, how am I actually transacting my business down to the point that I have my ticket that I can take the wife out to something? Absolutely. Good question. So super easy. Uh, once you've signed up and you're a member, you, you, you get credits in your account. So when you're logged in and you're going through the site, um, you can search globally for anything you want. You can type in, I want, you know, 
Chris Stapleton tickets and it'll tell you every anywhere Chris Stapleton's playing, but even more so on the discovery, like we talked about earlier, is just go in and start playing around and follow. Go to Chris Stapleton's page and click like. Go to Bass Hall and click like. Go to wherever, Dallas Cowboys and click like. And then as soon as you log in, you're going to start seeing all those events that are directly in your feed based upon what you chose to like. Um, it also has nearby events. So you, when you when you sign up, you give your zip code. So now I'll tell you all the events that are within 50 miles of where you live. So now all of a sudden you're, you're finding this. You pick one. So now you say, okay, I'm going to take the wife out to the Nutcracker at the Bass Hall or whatever. Um, so you click it, you go to the event page, and you'll immediately see the seats. And it will tell you, okay, you want you know, row 23, section five, and it's 52 credits or 28 credits, whatever it is. When you click it, it immediately goes to a shopping cart, just like any shopping cart. And, and then it will say, you know, are these the seats you want? You realize it's 28 credits times two. So it's, you know, 50, 56 credits or whatever it is. Um, and then, uh, and then you check out. And then once you check out, um, 56 credits gets removed from your account. So if you had 100, now you have 44. And you get its confirmation page that says, we've received your order. You get an email telling you we've received your order. And now in order to deliver those tickets, um, usually I'd say the large majority of our tickets are direct transfer. Uh, and what that means is at some level, that venue traditionally has a primary ticketing uh, has a primary ticketing relationship. So let's say Ticketmaster was the one who is has the rights to ticket that venue, right? So if this Nutcracker at Bass Hall was a Ticketmaster event, within a couple hours or less, you would receive an email from Festival Pass saying, uh, you know, Festival Pass has just sent you these tickets, click here to accept. You would accept them and they would then immediately um, be transferred directly into your Ticketmaster account and you'd show up at the venue and show the barcode and check out. Um, when it's not a direct transfer, um, there's, there's other ways. If you go to festivals, it's often a bracelet. So usually they get FedExed, right? So at checkout, it will say, oh, you, uh, you just bought two ACL bracelets. You know, here's your, give me your address and you'll receive them in two days by FedEx. Yeah, or maybe will call. Right. Or we'll call. Yeah. If yeah. Th there are some some of the smaller venues, we actually just send a PDF of the barcode uh, and you can use that to go in. And there are even some other venues that we have a ticketing technology within our app itself. Um, so we can generate a barcode that gets accepted at specific venues that accept it. But but again, the point is, is we're not trying to be a primary ticketer. We just want to be the place that all tickets can be accessed from. Yeah. So what about like venues that are trying to showcase maybe some of these smaller bands or or smaller acts or or something like that how can they partner with you to say hey normally we would sell this at 10 bucks at the door but if we partner with you maybe we'll do it for eight or whatever is there some kind of partnership that you're working with some of the smaller venues because by the way before you answer this and i'm not trying to you know knock you in the dirt but Jerry Jones doesn't need help selling Cowboys tickets, right? It's yep. more of, let me discover some stuff that I might not normally see. So are you partnering yep. with something, you know, in the smaller venues to kind of help them out? All the above. Yeah. So the reason we have all the big events is because uh, when you build a marketplace, you need supply and demand. So if somebody is going to come up and be willing to pay 50 or $100 a month, they need to know there's inventory, there's things they can buy, right? So we immediately solve that by doing a bunch of partnerships and we have 80,000 events. So if you sign up, there'll never be a time where you don't find an event you want to go to. Um, but where the magic comes in is, is everything you talk about, right? So we've built and will continue to build a bunch of relationships with venues, um, in many ways, right? So there's some venues that are ticketed by primary ticketing companies. So there's a couple out there that have 300 small venues and they're the primary ticketer for. So we'll partner with that primary ticketing company so that we can immediately have 300 small venues provide inventory on our platform. And yes, the whole point of it is just that, is we try and do deals with some of the, um, the venues so that 
they can provide um, their inventory in order to find new audiences without having to spend a bunch of uh, outbound digital media dollars. So instead of going out and spending 20 grand on Facebook to promote a show, they can come to us and we already have an audience. And if they you know, provide a 20 or 30% discount off the tickets, we'll be able to pass some of that value on to our members and they can find a new audience. So absolutely, we, we're continuing to build relationships where um, if they provide us tickets at a lower cost, we can promote them to our members and bring more audience. Yeah, so now let's go one step even deeper. What about a venue that doesn't go through the traditional Ticketmaster uh, buying tickets off the internet. It's literally cash at the door. Could this be an option for that venue to say, hey, let me partner with you and you're my exclusive ticketing option? Have you looked yeah, at I mean, that? Well, again, we have the technology to do that, meaning that we could easily take all the inventory of a small venue, provide it on our platform and have people come only to Festival Pass to be able to get the ticket uh, and, and provide that. There are, as you could probably imagine, a hundred other companies that do nothing but try and sell that small venue with their technology to, to ticket. Um, so, you know, again, we have the technology uh, and we would do that for a partner if they wanted us to be their ticketer. But our goal is not to go out and be a primary ticketer. Our goal is to have members and have special access and provide amazing inventory from all sources so that they can always enjoy live events. Right, and, and, and the only reason I ask this is, I mean, there's plenty of small venues, right, that actually have really good acts, yep. but you know, maybe they're a cash at the door and all of that stuff. And maybe there's one of those things on festival pass where it's like, Hey, you know, for three credits, this is somebody maybe you haven't seen, haven't heard of, but you know, if you were in, in I know this in your model, but let's say a credit is a dollar, right? Yep. So it, it's going to cost you 10 bucks at the door, but because you're on festival pass, it's going to cost you five credits and you can go check this out. And by the way, because you're on festival pass, you're going to get to meet this emerging artist, right? That maybe they have 50, hundred people showing up, but yep. you're a festival pass person. So not only do you pay less, but now you get to meet this emerging artist. It, have you thought? Have you thought anything around that? Absolutely. And part of our tiers is uh, giving opportunity to members that uh, are at higher tier levels will get more and more benefits like that, perks like that. Um, you know, bonus tickets. You know, if, if you're a ninety nine dollar member, you might be more apt to get offers for like five free shows a month because we happen to have a relationship with somebody that's got a hundred extra tickets that they didn't sell. And we're going to provide it to our members solely because that they are, we know they're a good audience for them. So yes, yes, yes. And yes, there's so many really fun, unique and interesting ways. And as we continue to grow, um, it enables us to understand who our members are and make sure we're providing the right amount of opportunity or offering to the right person at the right time. So if we have, you know, uh, 10,000 members in Dallas, I'm pretty sure that a couple hundred of them are going to be punk fans that like to go to Deep Ellum, right? So when, when somebody's at one of the, one, you know, one of the, the venues down at Deep Ellum and they, you know, the couple of days before they're like, Hey, you know, we still got about a hundred tickets left. You know, you want to provide them to your members so we can get a new audience at a discount. And the word discount is tough because one of the things that people don't like to do is they don't like to discount tickets because it, it cannibalizes full price. But when it's only available to members who've already committed to a subscription and it's obscured by credits as opposed to dollars, it makes it easier for the venues and the promoters to enable a, a rev share is a better word. Uh, rather than a discount because it doesn't cannibalize their full price tickets, but it helps fill the show. Right. Or, or maybe like using deep Ellum, of course, as an example, you go to a show in deep Ellum, let's say you go to trees and you, yep. you know, see a band or actually, uh, you go to three links cause Scott bags, he does a great job at three yep. links and putting on great shows, but maybe, 
because he's putting on a show there that night and he's got a great band coming in, but then there's a venue two doors down that, hey, if you go to this show, you also can go to this show. If you looked at anything like that is kind of a marketing ploy to kind of help some of the smaller clubs that aren't like three links or trees or whatever. And now we're getting really niche into DFW yeah. right now in deep uh, Ellum, but. Oh, I agree. I, I've, I've had a lunch with Scott Beggs. I, I know him, uh, but yes, uh, the answer is yes. So it's all about um, the more and more members we have, the more data we have, the more partners we have, the easier it is to use technology to make those connections. Um, so the answer is yes, yes, and yes. And, you know, we're still in the early stages and, you know, we, we have lots of uh, inventory and, you know, tens of thousands of members and we're still growing. So it's like, um, the answer is yes to all those questions. Beautiful. So what is the next step for festival pass? I mean, you've already accomplished a lot and everybody can already jump into this, but what's kind of that next piece that you're out there and you're looking and you're saying, here's the next piece I want to capture. Yeah, it truly is that uh, building out the artist relationships and the uh, the micro subscriptions and NFTs, right? So as we grow the audience, um, you know, 2022 is going to be great for us. Um, you know, we we have a huge demand of people wanting to go to events. We have a huge inventory of shows coming out, uh, as well as you know any live event, and we have a lot of artists really moving towards that tipping point of of how can I be part of this digital asset environment? So that's what's exciting to me, right? So we're going to continue to refine our technology to make it better UI and easier discovery and better data-driven recommendations. So that's constantly going on in the background every day. We're also going to start adding all the crypto integrations that I mentioned. Um, that's going to be happening in the next 30, 60 days. And then over the next three to six months, we're going to really lean heavily into these artist micro subscriptions, building the relationships with the artists, building their revenue streams, and then uh, minting some NFTs. So that's that's where we're at and we're super excited while we spend a bunch of money on letting everybody know what Festival Pass is. And you know, our goal by the end of 2022 is to have a million um, subscribers in total, at least 100,000 that are paid. Oh, nice. No, I mean, it's a fascinating idea. I, I really like it. And it, it goes to the old, uh, you know, the wife says, well, what's for dinner? Well, I don't know. Yeah. And, and it's kind of like you're solving that problem. I'm paying for this subscription and I can go get tickets to something. I can just pull this up and say, well, I've got these credits. Let's go do this or let's go do that. And you yeah. can actually look at this and say, well, you know, maybe I wouldn't spend money to go see this not knowing, but I have these credits and why not Perfect. spend these credits and go check something out that maybe I actually figure out I like. Yep. It's lower risk. It, and, and maybe it's a, you open it up and it's Wednesday night and you're like, maybe I'll go see a comedy show. I haven't seen a comedy show in a while. That sounds cool. Maybe I'll go see this band. I like cool. And your point is it's like, you've already, you've already committed. You've already decided to live life live. You've already decided that you have this bank account. It's almost like airline points. You have a bank account of a few hundred credits. What's the big deal? Let's use 20 of them tonight and go check out a band. Right. And, and it actually sounds less intrusive because like you say, or like I say, you're not forking out the money, so to speak. You've yep. already spent the money. So why not just go give something a shot? And next thing you know, you become a big fan of something you never would have heard of. That's, so, that's our, our mission is to get people to live life live, to get out more. I, I love it. So uh, what about COVID? I mean, COVID has thrown so many wrenches into live events and all of that stuff. And so there could be people that say, you're crazy trying to put together something to actually go to live events and put a subscription thing together with all this COVID stuff going on. I mean, what's your, what's your thoughts behind that? Yeah. So, so I, I understand the intricacies and we're, we're having this conversation today in, you know, mid December when there's a few, you know, things spiking up in, in the Northeast with Omicron and all that other kind of stuff. But, um, what I what I do know is the pent up demand for people to go to live events is big. 
vaccination rates keep keep climbing, testing for those that are unvaccinated keeps happening. So people are getting used to living with this world. And, and because of it, uh, there's a, it's already proven especially here in Texas and Florida, everybody's going out. Like, uh, and, and the reality is just be, we, we, we're not here to be the arbiters of telling what people should or shouldn't do. We're just making it easier and more social and more fun and more valuable for them to choose to do what they wanna do. And I always say to everybody, be safe. You know, if, you, if you're willing to go get vaccinated, it's the safest thing you can do. If not, wear a mask, if not get tested, whatever you're choosing to do. But I do believe that, um, especially going forward in 2022, there's going to be just a continued increase in demand for live events. And there's plenty of people willing to go and perform. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we all want to go see live events, whether it's live music, you, you alluded to comedy, you know, stand up comedy, uh, sporting events, all that. We, we like going and and seeing live events. I, I don't know anybody that doesn't, I guess maybe those folks just want to, sit at home and wear a VR headset and pretend that it, you know, they're doing that. And guess what? Good for them. That that's their thing. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, I'm not going to throw stones at them for that, but there are those folks that, you know, like obviously you and I, we like our live events and, and so we're going to go see our live events and, and we're going to have fun with that and do all that. So, uh, the last question I have for you, and I'm going to put you on the spot here. I, 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 I did not, I did not preface this at all. So I'm going to put you on the spot and you can tell me no, and, and this is not going to happen, but let's say you've got a, a member of festival pass and they create their account and they share this with folks. Do they get a benefit from that? And if they do, can we have a little promo code that, you know, maybe I can get some free concert tickets because I'm very, very cheap. And since the wolf is not here, I will not share that with them. Sure. Well, there's two things, right? So first of all, all members that are members of festival pass, even free members, um, if they, they, as soon as you sign up, you get a code, it, it automatically creates one for you. So if you then share that code with anybody and anybody else signs up, uh, even a free membership, you'll get three credits and they get three credits. So, you know, if somebody wants to go to free shows, if you get a hundred of your friends to sign up, you'll get 300 credits on the account and all your friends will each get a little bit of credits. And now you have 300 credits, which is, you know, equivalent to, probably almost $400 and you can go to any show you want to go. Oh, nice. So, so I'm going to sign up and, uh, it, you're going to see this long before this podcast, you know, comes out and I want mine to be Wolf Shepherd. Okay. That that's what I want my promo code to be. Okay. okay? So, so that way the wolf doesn't get any of this because he, he, he always takes all of the freebies from our podcast and he doesn't like to go to live events. So it's my time to shine, man. I, I, I so, finally get something out of here, right? Well, well if, what, what we can do though, is that if you sign up directly, you're going to get an auto generated number, but if you want a special vanity one, uh, email me separately and I'll have our developers create one for you. No, that's beautiful. No, I appreciate that. But seriously, everybody listening to this, that this is something that I kind of looked at in when uh, Kitcaster came to us and wanted to, you know, talk to you. I thought this is a fantastic idea. I mean, not only for the fact of there's so many times you don't know what you want to go do, but then for the people that know what they want to do, why not just go ahead and have one charge on their credit card every month and have a nice little account and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Oh, I got some extra credits. Maybe I'll go do this because if you have those extra credits, you wouldn't go do that. But because you have them, you'll go do it. And then you're going to find somebody you like, whether it's stand-up comedy, a, a sports team, a, a band. Why not, right? I agree. Yeah, I love it. So, uh, Ed, as we close, tell us how to find the website, how to find out more about you if people have questions, all that stuff, because hopefully 
this has opened some questions in people's minds and everything, and maybe they want to reach out to your company and all that good stuff. Give us the 30 second to minute commercial of all that good stuff. Sure. The easiest thing is festivalpass.com. That's the, the web app. You can find us there, sign up. You can sign up for free. You can sign up for a paid subscription. Um, you can gift a subscription. It's a, we talk about the greatest gift of the holiday, right? Give somebody a year of live events. It's pretty good. Oh, oh, we should have went over that. So talk about the gift subscription. So I, I can actually go in and give this to somebody. Yeah, just you, right when you go to the main website, right in the top left, you'll see buy, subscri- buy a gift. And you can gift it and basically put in an email of somebody you want, you, you pay for a subscription, buy them an annual subscription. It's a, an amazing gift. And now if you paid for the full $99 a month for, for 12 months, I think it's about a 15% discount or so for doing a whole year, but you can, you know, about a thousand bucks, you can give somebody over a thousand credits to go do whatever they want for the next 12 months. Um, or you, you can get smaller ones as well, smaller subscriptions as well, but, uh, but that's good. And then basically you choose to send them that code, right? So a lot of people say, shit, what do I get somebody for Christmas? All the container ships are off the coast. There's no products in the stores. This is just easy to do virtual. And now for the next 12 months, somebody can have a lot of fun. Nice. Now, fantastic product, fantastic service. Love it. Uh, I will be subscribing uh, after this. I'm going to sign up. I, I I really like it, Ed. It's fantastic. So uh, thanks for spending some time with me. Uh, thank you for hiding this from the wolf so I get the benefit of this, just so we're clear. you know. So now I'm going to go to the shows because, I mean, he's British. He has no taste. I mean, you know how those people are. <laughs> but anyway, uh, everybody reach out to Ed and look up Festival Pass. All this information is going to be on our website. Ed, we certainly appreciate you joining us, and that will do it for this episode of The Wolf and the Shepherd, and we will catch you on the next one.